Okay, so let me start. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Pavel Romanchuk from Institute for Theoretical Biology at Humboldt University in Berlin. And uh, as far as I understand, uh, Pavel uh, heads a group there. So maybe uh, since uh, it is not an unfamiliar name for me, of course, I know some of the works of Pavel. Uh, but maybe um, since time is not uh, limited and there is quite a lavish amount of time, actually, uh, Pavel can start with a few words about his group and uh, uh, his uh, career uh, before. And after that, uh, he will give us a talk uh, about, uh, just a second, uh, about self-organization and functions and flocks and schools. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do this. Thanks a lot for this uh, nice introduction. So let me maybe just before I, I start and introduce my group, um, just share the desktop to make sure that we can then start immediately with the talk. Um, so I hope you can see my slide, my title slide. Uh, yes, we can see. Okay. Um, great. So, um, yeah, um, as it was rightly said, I'm uh, a head of the Collective Information Processing Group at the Institute for Theoretical Biology. Um, and first of all, I should say it's a great honor and great pleasure to be here at the Ising Lectures again. Um, even if it's only online, I hope next time maybe I can visit Lviv again, which was really great doing this two or oh, now three years ago. Um, and I really enjoyed like the first talks already. In, you know, the first two days was really exciting, and then you know already the breadth of the talks was really nice, uh, which kind of also reflects a little bit the kind of my career path, which led me to the place where I'm right now. So I'm at the Institute for Theoretical Biology, which is part of the Department of Biology and the Faculty of Life Science at the Humboldt University in Berlin. But my background is actually in physics. So I studied physics at the Technical University of Berlin and did my PhD at the Humboldt University together with Lutz Szymanski Gaia on stochastic processes. But already at that time, I was very much interested also in connecting physics to biological uh, systems and to, to enhance our understanding of biological systems through methods from uh, statistical, physical, and stochastic processes. And this path kind of led me uh, as a postdoc further more towards biology. So I'm really now at the biology department. But still, um, I would consider myself a physicist or a biophysicist or biological physicist because this is something that you luckily never get rid of um, and which gives you this right set of mind the right thing uh, the right approach to complex systems which i think is very very important and very helpful when trying to understand also uh, biological systems and in fact uh, i do actually quite a lot of teaching here in biophysics degree so i actually usually teach quantum mechanics and statistical physics and mechanics so all the things i taught in the same way when I was a, a teaching assistant at the physics department, but now for biophysics students. Um, <clears throat> so my group started here already five years ago, uh, 2016, um, and this is a group supported by the German uh, Science Foundation, um, which allows junior researchers to start their own independent research group. So I'm not a professor yet, but I have still the full independence to work on, uh, together with my students, my PhD students and postdocs on the topics which are related to self-organization and function in biological systems and in particular collective behavior. And this is also the main <laughs> talk or the main topic of this talk today. Um, I should also mention that I'm not only associated with the Institute for Theoretical Biology but also with the Bernstein Center for Computational Neuroscience as well as the Excellence Cluster Science of Intelligence which is like a giant uh, or pretty big cluster well funded by the German Science Foundation uh, where very different disciplines, so in our case it also includes uh, engineering, robotics, um, computer science, but also biology and neuroscience, um, where we try to bring researchers from very different perspectives to try to understand what is intelligence as this very complex and, and, and um, still not well understood phenomenon. So everyone talks about intelligence, but if you ask uh, um, 50 researchers to define intelligence, they will all give you different, slightly different de definitions. Um, and my part there is uh, what I'm working on in, within this cluster is actually collective intelligence, which very much relates to the topic of this talk as well and my general research interest, collective behavior and biology. So maybe this is, is a general introduction which took uh, one, two minutes longer. Um, I hope to catch up with my talk 
on this. Um, so let me start just with some motivation and um, introduction to the systems that we're going to look at. If you think of um, collective behavior or collective movement, we can already observe this in nature in the smallest scales if you think of bacterial colonies and bacterial swarms. And these are examples here of, of bacteria on a substrate that move together and they form these nice dense clusters. These bacteria are rod shaped and simply due to steric interactions, um, they may coordinate a movement and, and start to move in this nice uh, coherent groups. On the other hand, you can move up the scales um, to uh, meters, um, and then you can think of fish moving together that show these beautiful examples of collective movement, highly coordinated, where it looks like the fish moves basically as it's controlled by a single mind. But essentially, what we know now is that it's really controlled by, by few local interactions between neighbors that allow the, the whole system to self-organize uh, in this beautiful fashion. And the same holds also for bird of, uh, flocks of birds. So you, you see here displays of starlings. I think it's over the, might be in Rome actually. Um, so where you can see uh, hundreds or even thousands or ten thousands of birds um, performing these beautiful displays in the air, which are really uh, beautiful to, to watch. And you know, last motivating example, probably one of the largest examples of swarming or collective movement in biology are locust swarms. They can consist of millions of individuals and span several kilometers in size and travel over continental length scales. So um, this is you know, also something which, which is, has been studied by different researchers, but this also is an example of self-organized collective behavior. So when we look into um, nature, we see then this, all these beautiful examples that I've shown of, um, co uh, of coordinated collective behavior. And from a physicist's point of view, uh, what really started me uh, getting really fascinated about the systems is that you can think now of actually, are there any universal laws or principles that govern the behavior of the systems? Um, although these are very different species, very different times and length scales, and um, are there any universal principles that actually apply to all, the, the, uh, all of the systems in the same way? So this is something that you know I'm highly interested from a physics perspective. But also from a biological or functional perspective, these systems are, are quite interesting or, or very interesting to look at. Because in contrast to physical systems, these uh, groups of animals, like say a school of fish, just doesn't come together due to basic physical laws. The fish actually decide themselves to come into the group. They have evolved to be in this collective state um, because it actually gives them advantages for survival. Um, and that makes them more, more evolutionarily successful in the long term. And there are many theories in biology why um, being in a group, being in a school, being in a flock is actually more advantageous, more beneficial for individuals. And a lot of these uh, benefits can be actually summarized under what I call collective information processing or collective computations. So in a sense, if you are in a group and there's a predator attacking the group, then you don't have to see the predator yourself. You can actually rely on social information by the response of others from your uh, of, of neighbors from the group um, to realize, oh, there might be some danger. And maybe if this other fish fly, uh, uh, flees and moves away, I should escape as well. So this is like one example of potential benefits that groups can uh, convey to individuals. And what I'm particularly interested in is now bringing these two perspectives, the physics perspective and the biology perspective together. Because whatever function you have um, in terms of um, for, for, the, for the of the collective, in terms of the benefits it might give also to the individual, it will be at the same time subject to the constraints set by the self-organizing nature of these uh, complex systems, collective systems. In a sense, you can argue the biological function is actually uh, constrained by the physics of the systems. If you think of uh, um, of these systems, a self-organizing system that follows simple rules, similar, for example, to Ising model or XY model, if you think of statistical uh, physics models. So they they are not independent. They have to interplay. So whatever the agents do will affect the states, the macroscopic states of the um, of the school or of the group. On the other hand, the macroscopic states of the school will also constrain what an individual sees and perceives 
and uh, what it decides to do based on this macro, uh, all its local surrounding, which is of course related also to the macroscopic state of the entire system. So um, working at the interface of physics and biology, you realize that there are strengths to both of the, or importance to both of the science. And um, what is particularly uh, great about physics and statistical physics, that we have this uh, broad range of methods, how to investigate complex systems, which were developed over uh, decades and, and centuries now. Um, you know, if you think of statistical physics, uh, how to describe systems with many degrees of freedom. So in a sense, one could argue that physics is very good at addressing the how question. So how does a system self-organize? How do we see emergence of order on a macroscopic scale? However, what, the, what physics cannot answer uh, is the why question. So why do the fish do what they do? Why do they order? Why do they come in a group together? And this is uh, intrinsically connected to the function of these systems, to the biological function of the systems. And therefore, this is something which is outside of the realm of physics. And this is why you need to combine both perspectives if you really want to um, gather understanding and better understanding of these uh, uh, systems. So you have to talk as a physicist, you have to talk to biologists to, to really understand what the function is, what the evolutionary background is. And this is like a core kind of theoretical construct on the biological side, uh, evolution theory. So you have everything that you look at in terms of self-organization has to make sense also in the light of evolutionary theory. And this is actually um, related to a famous quote uh, by Theodosius Dobzhadinsky, who was an uh, actually Ukrainian-American um, biologist, a very famous geneticist and evolutionary biologist, who coined this quote um, in 1973 in a famous essay of him, um, where he uh, just said, you know, whatever you look in evolution, nothing makes sense except, sorry, whatever you look uh, into in biology, nothing makes sense except in light of evolution. And this is something that, you know, one has to keep in mind also as a physicist working on biological systems, um, at least in my opinion. Um, so this is so far like the general uh, interface, but how do we model actually uh, flocks or schools of fish? So basically the type of methods that we use to describe the systems uh, more from a theoretical or model point of view is, we essentially describe individuals by equations of motion. So you have, you know, it's pretty standard. So you have some, uh, change in uh, position vectors given by the velocity vector, and then you have an uh, equation of motion um, where um, the evolution of the velocity is given by some effective, you can call them forces, basically effective interactions of the individual with the environment or between the individuals themselves. And typically you also have some random term here, which accounts for potential fluctuations that might come either from the internal dynamics of the agent or uh, external environmental fluctuations. So essentially you have a system of n-coupled Langevin equation that describe you the evolution of this, uh, um, for example, animal group or bacterial swarm. And the great thing is if you come from theoretical physics or from, from applied math, there are actually well-developed tools how to coarse grain this type of equation to move from this individual level perspective to um, actually equations on the coarse grain level for the um, density field and the velocity fields, and you can do some analytical calculations on that as well. Of course, you can also take directly this individual level um, uh, equation and put them in numerical uh, in a computer and do numerical simulations. And right now you can do quite big simulations with up to millions of individuals uh, pretty fast, for example, using graphical uh, processing units, GPUs, which can uh, speed up the calculation massively. However, if you just do the this, straightforward simulations, usually you have quite some parameters, of course, in these microscopic models. And it's sometimes hard to understand, you know, where are actually interesting parameter regimes um, that uh, one should look at with your simulations. Um, and brute force simulating all the parameters is just not an option. So here, having this theoretical methods in place, already starting from maybe simple mean field approximation, might provide you additional information to identify what are actually the interesting parameter regimes, um, even if only very approximate, but still what are the interesting parameter regimes where, for example, phase transition happen um, or, or uh, changes, qualitative changes in, in behavior and what different states you should be expected to observe. Um, so this is um, basically the kind of methods that we work with. And if we look in the history of flocking or, or schooling models, that have been used to describe animal groups, there's actually like a, um, most of them or the, the vast majority of them actually uses 
um, as I shown before, something like phenomenological social forces. So basically, phenomenological assumptions how individuals should interact, uh, based which are actually very strongly influenced by physics type models, models of interacting particles, where you have basically at short range some sort of repulsion that makes sure that uh, agents or individuals just don't collide. So they want to keep a, a, some minimal distance. At intermediate range, you have some sort of alignment, which you can think of as a paramagnetic alignment, essentially, where an agent assess the local neighborhood, uh, what the other animals are doing, in what direction are they moving, and tries to align its velocity and its uh, movement direction to the direction of its neighbors. And then at some long range, if you want to have a cohesive group, um, you typically have some kind of an attraction to make sure that the group stays together. So if one agent moves away, it gets attracted, uh, or farther away, it gets attracted by others and starts to move uh, towards the, the flock or the swarm. But if you look in the literature, you realize that this type of models that have been, um, that already have these three ingredients have been around for quite a long time. So the very first one was actually proposed by Suzuki and Sakai in 1973, and it already had like an equation of motion with the three components, repulsion, alignment, and attraction. However, it was published in Japanese in a Japanese biophysics journal, and therefore um, probably not many people paid attention to this at that point. But since then, many different variants of this type of models have been proposed in the literature, like Reynolds, which was actually meant for computer science, for generating computer graphics. For physics, a very influential, probably the most important one was um, the paper by Vichek et al, where they proposed a minimal extension of the XY model, which I will talk a little bit more in a minute. And then for biology, a very influential paper was the one by Kazan et al, where they introduced the so-called three-zone model, which combines the three interactions, and made it more popular to a biology audience, and, and started basically the whole business of using models to understand self-organization in these collective systems more systematically in the biological sciences. And if you're interested, I definitely would exp um, uh, recommend this web page by Dirk Brockman and colleague of mine from the Humboldt University, who does these beautiful demonstrations or little apps that you can try online. And there's also one for the cousin model, where you can uh, play around with the dynamics of the cousin model by changing parameters and seeing how the system self organize um, um, directly in your web browser. So let's have a look a bit, bit closer at the Vichic model as a kind of a, a physics-based model or most physics-based model. So it's essentially a non-equilibrium version of the XY model uh, for, for onset of paramagnetism. Um, and the idea is basically that you have all the ingredients of the XY model with the one exception that the spins actually are not fixed on a lattice or you know, off lattice in space but that they can actually move and they move in the direction they are pointing to. So really like that you can think of the spin or this vector as a, a heading direction or a velocity vector of uh, an animal. So these are the, the fundamental equation. Basically what you have is an instantaneous alignment, in discrete time steps, you have an instantaneous alignment of a focal particle in, here in the middle to the average heading direction uh, of its neighbors within a certain metric distance epsilon here. So basically this red agent then defines, uh, decides to align at a discrete time with its local neighborhood. So this is what all agents do in sim simultaneously in time. And in addition, you have some noise on this orientation of this vector, which uh, acts together with the density as one of the control parameters. And then there's this displacement along uh, this movement direction set by the vector uh, with a constant speed V0. And one core property of the system is that we don't have any uh, momentum conservation. And this is typically referred to as dry active matter to make it different or to distinguish it from something like uh, fluid active matter, where you would have actually a surrounding fluid where you have to account also for the fluid and momentum conservation between the movement of agent and fluid. But if you think of, let's say, ants or, or locus or uh, something like this moving on a substrate, that would be basically an example of a dry active matter. May I put here a question, Paolo? Yeah. Uh, the space dimension matters, obviously. Uh, you are speaking now about two-dimensional thing or in general? So the Vichek model was introduced in two dimensions first, uh, but since then mm -hmm. people also looked at the one dimension, uh, like one dimensional mm -hmm. version of this, as well as three dimensional version of this. Um, mm -hmm. And um, Regarding the, the phase transition uh, properties right now, I'm actually not sure 
What the differences are, whether anyone looked at this in the very much detail, most studies are actually in 2D. And they're already in 2D, things are kind of complicated. I will allude to this a little bit shortly. Uh, but um, yeah, most of them are in 2D. And it, I typically, when, you, when one speaks about the Vichek model, one refers to 2D. Thank you. So this was um, the original figure from, from Vichek's work, which actually shows this, this essentially a novel type of phase transition, as they claim, because it was a non equilibrium system. And what it was a big surprise at that time to the uh, corresponding physics community was that you can think of the Vichek model as a kind of minimal extension of the XY model. But for the XY model, we know that there's no long range order in 2D, according to the Marvin Wagner theory. Um, but Vichek et al. reported that there is actually long range order when you allow the spins to move in the, uh, in the, in the direction that they're heading to, which was kind of a, a revolution at that time, and, and a lot of people actually didn't believe these results um, until it was confirmed actually by theoretical calculations as well. So the systems actually order and really this finite small velocity, it can be arbitrarily small, but as long as you have this, as long as you have some convection in the system, you actually break the Marvin Wagner theorem and you can get long range order in 2D. Um, so, and you know, maybe what one should note is that it looks kind of continuous as a continuous phase transition um, in this original publication. How does this look? Examples of such a dynamics of the Vichek model. So here you see this, uh, you see this uh, emergence of order and because the spins or the particles move, of course we see all this also non-trivial spatial dynamics which seems or which turns out to play a really important role um, in uh, the overall macroscopic behavior of the system. If we increase the noise a little bit, but it's still, um, so to say, subcritical, so it still orders, but you can see that the structures change, um, that the system gets much more homogeneously distributed, although not fully, you still have these giant uh, density fluctuations, but nevertheless, the system also orders in this higher noise regime as well. But of course, if you would increase noise even further, at some point you are above the critical point um, and you would get this order. So there's actually a theory for the um, uh, Wittig model, the so-called Toner 2 theory proposed by John Toner and Yuhai Tu briefly um, after the uh, Wittig published their work. Um, and it's essentially like a phenomenological hydrodynamic theory, which following the idea of the Navier-Stokes equation, just attempts to write something like a Navier-Stokes equation for these uh, flocking systems, for these active systems. And uh, one important thing is that in addition to Navier-Stokes uh, equation, for example, you get some additional derivative terms here on the left-hand side, because for this dry active matter and lack of momentum conservation, you have also absence of daily and invariance. So you, ha you have to, at least for symmetry reason, you have to uh, take these terms also into account. And by assuming the existence of an ordered homogeneous space, uh, John Toner and Yuhai Tu were able to, to um, provide testable predictions and exact scaling components uh, for these ordered phase, um, um, which is typically also referred now as a Toner 2 phase. However, following this theory, which was kind of nice, um, and then you know, a lot of progress was made, and then um, there started to, uh, questions to appear about the nature of the phase transition. And first, Gregoire and Chate actually said, well, we actually can show that this phase transition is not continuous, but it's actually discontinuous. And after this paper, there was actually a prolonged controversy in the field um, between Vicek et al. and Chate et al. Uh, what is the nature of the phase transition, which I think took more than 10 years, and I witnessed this as a student uh, with the different standpoints at conferences discussing. Um, where um, people still claim that it's this, a continuous transition like Vichek and also others, uh, while Chatee and colleagues were, were uh, providing more and more evidence that it's actually a discontinuous transition. And this is just one example um, of this discontinuity. If you go to a sufficiently large system, you suddenly see a jump in the order parameter, which can be also confirmed by a binder covalent, which actually shows this uh, p negative peak here, which is actually a hallmark of a discontinuous phase transition. And this is just a time trace, so a time series of the order parameter versus time, and you nicely see the sudden jumps into uh, uh, showing by stability of the system, which also point to a discontinuous transition. And, and there was a lot of discussion, you know, what whether there would be some minimal differences in the model which could explain this difference in phase transition. But right now, we have actually a pretty well understanding that it is, seems to be indeed a, a uh, first order 
uh, phase transition. And the reason for this is that we have density order coupling, uh, which is a, a fundamental property of these um, metric flocking models. So basically your parameters here driving the order in your hydrodynamic theory, they are not constants. They actually, de they are functions of density and typically scaling linearly with density. And this introduces this coupling between local density and local order, which eventually le leads to this first order like transition um, because the homogeneous ordered state becomes uh, unstable close to the critical line. So this is the critical line. This would be the mean field, um, you know, if you, this is noise and this is density. So if you decrease noise from a disordered state, you enter the ordered state. This would be the mean field line, so to say, but there is this close to this, there's always like a layer where the homogeneous state becomes unstable and you get actually some spatial structure, which leads um, that you never observe a continuous transition, but you observe a discontinuous one. And the spatial structures that you observe are this large scale bands that appear there. So they, they move, uh, the systems moves in the perpendicular direction, but you get these giant structures that move through the system. And um, you can actually, there's an all pretty well understanding that they always emerge in metric models. However, you might have to go to very large system to really see the true nature um, of the space transition to be discontinuous. So this is like, uh, you know, one could talk probably on hours only about this topic, um, but I don't have that much time. So I will just uh, go back to my research interest. So how is this topic, which I've been also working a lot um, over the past years, how is this relevant actually for the dynamics and function of real biological systems? So first of all, as I said, before, real biological collectives are, are not super large. So the largest one are of the order of millions, so 10 to the 6. But the most prominent group size that we observe for fish schools or bird flocks are actually rather of the order of 100 or 1,000. So this is not really what you would call a thermodynamic limit. So if you want to understand the function of the systems, you have, whether you want or not, you have to deal with finite size behavior of the systems, or to put it differently, finite size behavior will determine and constrain the biological function of these systems. So then there's the question, you know, is there anything which we would call in a statistical physics sense universality? Probably not. You know, of course, there, there should be like a length scale or size of the system above which it behaves more or less universal and where the microscopic details don't play a role anymore. But we have no idea what this length scale is, what the system size is. And that means that very likely um, a lot of these systems are non-universal and the actual microscopic details uh, play a role. So, for example, uh, interactions, what sorts of interactions we have. Not only the symmetries, but really maybe like higher order properties of these interactions might play a role. What is the role of fluctuations? How are fluctuations implemented in the uh, dynamics of individuals? And related to this, what would be the role of environmental heterogeneity if you think something like quench disorder? And um, these are all open questions which have received over the past years more and more attention. And um, last but not least, very important question from a biological point of view, we still have no real idea or there are many questions uh, open regarding what is the actual interaction between individual agents, individual particles, so when you want to think about this, in such a system. So it's very different to physics. In physics, you know, we know what the interaction between atoms is. We know what the interaction between molecules is. Um, you know, we can trace it back to fundamental forces in physics. In biology, we don't have a very good idea of this. We have some idea, but not a very good one. So there's a lot of open questions how maybe differences in this action, interaction might affect the large scale behavior and the function of these systems. Just to give you one fundamental example, which is still more or less open, we don't even know who interacts with whom in such a system. So, as I said, most models of uh, active matter uh, or this flocking system, you typically assume some metric interaction. So you have a finite interaction range and you have only local interaction with all the agents within this range. However, um, there are also experiments that suggest you rather interact with a so-called topological neighborhood where you interact with, let's say, five nearest neighbors or six nearest neighbors, independent on the actual distance. Or another version of such a topological distance independent interaction would be so-called Voronoi interaction, where you interact with your first shell of neighbors um, and uh, also independent on the actual distance. So whether a fish is half a meter away or one meter away, it doesn't make much of a difference um, if you think of such interactions. Um, and last but not least, you can think of some kind of a more, even more biologically motivated visual interaction. So this is like a reconstruction of a potential visual network. So who sees whom in such a swarm if you account for occlusions 
in 2D so that they, they cannot see past each other. And then, of course, this network is, is, is rather different. Um, and this is still very much open what the consequences of this type of networks are for collective behavior. However, what we know actually is that the Voronoi network seems to be like a pretty good approximation of the visual interactions. So typically, uh, this is much easier to uh, computation and compute. So uh, this is um, much nicer to work with. May I ask a question here? Of course. Um, uh, wouldn't you get more information if you subtract, so to say, the overall movement? So in your example you show here, you have a movement a lot, not along a straight line, but you have a curved movement. And yeah. if you subtract this, then you better can relate the local order to this general movement. So this it's is what's being... Yeah, yeah I, 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 so this is what's being done in the field. So this is uh -huh. established that you remove the, the uh, fundamental mode of movement, so you remove the average velocity of the system and look at the velocity fluctuations, for example. So this is being done, and this is, for example, how correlation functions are calculated in order to see um, something I will briefly talk about, like hallmarks of potentially critical behavior, which is like uh, correlation functions that grow with system size. So yes, this is an excellent point. You have to do all these things, um, which we know actually, you know, from, from physics that, you know, it might be important to get better information. But yes, um, people do this. Okay. Um, Thank you. All right. So this is, this is um, basically like just to show how little we know actually about the systems and how sometimes it's difficult to move forward. So this is maybe the big difference to, to statistical physics at the moment where we stand on the shoulder of giants and we have this really well established theoretical foundation where we know when we move forward we very likely don't have to change the whole fundament um, but in biology or like looking at this biological systems you have you build basically like a building on a shaky raft all the time your theoretical building and you have to be ready to to start over because it topples down because some fundamental things change in the bottom so this is um, of course uh, uh, very disheartening sometimes but also makes it very exciting because a lot of things may change in a very short time. Um, so regarding here, I wanted uh, in the second half of my talk, I wanted to give some two examples, brief examples of the recent work that was actually addressing some of the gaps that I mentioned um, in, the, uh, in my introduction or in the, in the first half. So one is um, a recent work that we did with a visiting grad student, Parisa Romani, as well as Fernando Peruani, um, a theoretical physicist who is now in Paris. Um, um, where we looked at this flocking dynamics in heterogeneous environments, and the first paper was more kind of functional, asking biology question, whereas the second paper, who, which is now in revision, looks more at the physics uh, topic or, or physics questions uh, in terms of self-organization. Um, but the general idea was to think of now agents trying to coordinate, not in a plane environment as most models um, of this flocking look at, but really in a complex or heterogeneous environment where a focal individual or focal particle needs to interact not only with its social neighbors like other agents but maybe also with environmental features and here you can think of a fish that wants to coordinate its movement with other fish but may also want to avoid uh, let's say this vegetation here because it might be a predator and might be dangerous and one particular question we were interested in is to take into account also potential limits in perception so that then agent or a fish here cannot pay attention to arbitrary many objects but only to few nearest objects in the environment which is very different also to physics systems where you can have always superposition of arbitrary many forces and you get an effective force but this is not likely uh, what or this is for sure not what takes place in biological systems because here the agent need to see stuff they need to pay attention to stuff and they need to respond to stuff so the cognitive and sensory constraints will also constrain the interactions. So we have the systems of many fish in this heterogeneous or complex environment, and we, what we assume is that each agent, each fish can pay attention only to canyous objects. And, and all agents try to coordinate with other neighbors in their environment. However, they get too close to this environmental features here, um, this distraction or avoidance zones, they want to move away from this because it might pose danger. And in addition, there are few informed agents that know which one, which direction they want to go. So they want to bias the movement of the whole flock in the right direction. 
So you can think of this informed agent as a kind of a field applied to the system that tries to align the, the, the whole system with this uh, additional information provided to the system. And our question was here, um, so they want to move around correct direction and this will be here around to the right. And our question was, how does this collective process, um, collective systems actually process information on the right direction of motion? How does it coordinate and order based on this parameter K, which sets the limited attention of agents? So basically how many objects I can pay attention to? And objects can be both, can be other neighbors, but also this environmental features. So there's a kind of a trade of I cannot pay attention to as many things as possible. So let's first look at the emerging networks, interaction networks. And you know, this is basically like a static snapshot of the system. And what you see here is what you would expect. If you have a low attention capacity of individual agents, so low K, you get this disconnected clusters, like a fragmented overall network, where only agents within these clusters interact with each other. And these red agents here are actually within this avoidance zone, so they want to move away from the center of this blue circles always. Whereas the black uh, agents are just happy to coordinate their movement with others. On the other hand, if you increase K, so you have a have high attention capacity, then the picture changes dramatically and you get this um, well-connected network, more or less like a giant component emerging. And this is just a cutout of a larger system, which is essentially fully connected, apart from the few agents that interact here with the environment and therefore uh, just pay attention to the environment. So now if you could, would ask, okay, if I now put in information to the system, so I bias certain agents to move in a certain direction, where do you think would the system be better at following the external field, so to say, or the external information? And from classical network theory, you would assume it would be on the right-hand side, because this is a better net connected network, so the information should diffuse better through this network. And this is actually also what you observe if you consider empty environments without this blue heterogeneities in the, in the uh, environment. Basically, if you increase K, so go from this dark curve to this yellow curve, your accuracy of following this preferred direction of motion um, increases and it also increases with the ratio of informed individuals. So here you would have a fully informed system, so everyone knows what the right direction of motion is. Here you would have only a few percent of informed individuals. But you see this very steep increase, so the system very quickly follows these few informed individuals, but also with increasing K, you improve the accuracy, which is essentially like the, the order parameter we look at. But the picture changes dramatically. So this is what you naively would expect. So large K, better connected network, high accuracy. But if you move now to heterogeneous environments, the picture actually reverses. So instead of getting better with increased K, with increased network connectivity, your accuracy actually goes down. So even a fully informed system is worse at uh, uh, coordinating and, and moving along the right direction of motion as a minimally attentive system with uh, K1, where only one or two percent of individuals are informed. So having this kind of strongly reduced connectivity, strongly reduced attention of individuals, actually facilitates emergence of order, emergence of uh, accurate collective movement. And we wanted to understand why, and the best thing at this is to actually uh, look at the, what happens in the real system. And this is just one example uh, of for high attention capacity, so K24. And what you can see in this complex environment is that locally the system is able to order. So you get this nice swarms of flocks moving or trying to move through the empty spaces in the environment. However, because of the high attention capacity, every agent also detects whenever it interacts with the environment, whenever it comes in this avoidance zone. And therefore, the uh, local, like globally, there's no um, order emerging because everyone or, or the, the system locally tries to follow this free paths in the environment, which are basically randomly distributed. So the accuracy, which would be here, go to the right. This is the uh, right direction of motion provided by the informed individuals, which are the open symbols. So there are only 10% of informed individuals. So the right direction would be to move to the right, but the system fails at doing so. But it is actually pretty good at avoiding the obstacles, so which is which is good. So they really follow the free paths in the environment. On the other hand, at low attention capacity, um, things change uh, dramatically. So first of all, you see still emergence of local order, but you don't see these dense clusters emerging anymore, but rather like small clusters of one, two, three particles moving together. However, on the long time scales, if you wait long enough, you suddenly see that your accuracy grows over time, and in the long term, you can already see it here, 
the system starts to move along the preferred direction of motion on average. So you see actually emergence of global order. You see alignment with the preferred direction of motion provided by the few informed individuals. And, um, but the system seems to ignore the environmental features. So they order collectively, they move in one direction. So therefore they have high accuracy, but the agents are very bad at avoiding the obstacles, at avoiding the blue circles here. They basically become blind to the environment. And this explains now why we have this high accuracy. Essentially, when you have this nearest neighbor interaction with only the nearest neighbor, when you start coordinating your movement, you very likely end up being closer to your neighbor. But that means that your interaction or your attention is saturated by your social cue, by your neighbor. And you become blind to the environmental features as well as other neighbors. So basically, you pay attention only to the nearest object. This is, happens to be just another agent, another particle. You are happy and you move forward. And you just basically run over these environmental features, which we modeled here as kind of soft core repelling sites. So it's not, you know, there's no real hardcore something like that. So you, they can write, but you can think of this as a danger zone around some kind of a little uh, plant or something like that. So basically the agent becomes unresponsive to this environmental heterogeneity, but because of that can uh, very efficiently coordinate the movement on a collective scale. So what we get is actually, um, sorry, I should maybe go back. Uh, one important thing to uh, note that um, they, you can also quantify how well they are avoiding these obstacles, and this is here, and what you can see here is it's much lower than we saw in the previous uh, part. So basically, they, as I said, they just run over these obstacles. So what we see here is this fundamental trade-off in a sense. So first, if you look at um, collective accuracy, it becomes maximal as small k, at small attention capacities, at very loosely connected networks. This is where we get the highest accuracy because of the self-organizing effect that I just described, the self-organized isolation from the environmental destruction or the environmental noise. And if you increase K, you know, this uh, accuracy goes down and these different curves are just for different densities of the heterogeneities in the environment. So this will be the lowest density here. And then if you increase the density of heterogeneities, these effects get more and more pronounced. On the other hand, if you quantify the ability to avoid the heterogeneities, to, to really be responsive to the environment, you can show here that for low attention capacity, the collective is actually much worse than individual solitary agents that just don't interact socially, which would be the black line here. And only above the critical attention capacity, a group is actually able to outperform individual agents, which is also something which is new because usually one thinks a group is always better than agents. Well, not in this case. Um, and you know, this is just one um, core result of this work. And um, what we think is that it might be like a fundamental trade-off uh, this coordination responsiveness rate, which could be true for many different collective information processing systems, similar to a speed accuracy trade-off, which has been studied by different people. And the results, I cannot go more into detail, but the results are very robust with respect to the variations of the model. So for example, maybe an interesting variation from a physics point of view, you could also get rid of these informed individuals. You could just say, you know, the agents want to align with themselves, um, and in the absence of obstacles, in the absence of uh, the heterogeneity, you will just get spontaneous symmetry breaking eventually if your noise is not too strong, and you would get an ordered phase like in the Vichic model. And you get, but you get exactly the same trade-off, but now this trade-off would be between order and responsiveness to the environment versus K. So it's really, um, it's really like uh, does not depend on the information or this external field provided to um, uh, to the system. Okay, so this was the first um, part just to show you that, you know, there are non-trivial effects emerging if you, if you really look at the function of these systems. And another topic which is very dear to my heart, I want to talk about the last 10 to 15 minutes, is um, about criticality in collective systems. And this is work um, recently published together with a grad student, a PhD student of mine, Pascal Klamser, who just also defended his thesis uh, a few months ago. So what is this about? Well, there has been quite a long history of um, people suggesting that biological systems, in particular biological collective systems, should be viewed as self-organized critical systems. And it goes back to Bach, who was the inventor of self-organized criticality, 
um, who looked here, for example, in this paper, uh, uh, game of life type of things, and could, and they claim that this is uh, a self-organized critical system. But there are more recent works where, for example, Mora and Bialek. Um, really discussed this in the context of uh, neuronal systems like brain dynamics, uh, as well as Munoz uh, collecting a lot of different examples and, and um, also uh, theoretical support for this idea that, bio, uh, that biological systems should be um, at, should operate at criticality and should be self-organized critical systems. Why is that? Well, you can actually show that many uh, different um, aspects of collective computation become optimal or are kind of maximal at pseudo-critical points, if you think of finite size systems. And this goes back to the work by Longton um, in cell automata, but also there are more newer works, for example, inspired by neuronal networks by Kinuchi Copelli, or some kind of uh, uh, genetic regulatory networks by Hidalgo and all. Um, so there's quite some work on this, um, which suggests um, that this collective computation optimized at critical points which is related to really the fundamental physics, essentially, and the maximum susceptibility that we already heard about uh, in this lecture. For the brain, there's actually quite an active community researching this, and there's actually quite some empirical evidence that suggests that brain or neural networks may actually operate either at criticality or very close to criticality. And I don't want to go too much into details there, but I'm happy to discuss this. Um, and based on this general notion, there was also the uh, suggestion or the conjecture that animal groups, these flocks, should also operate in a critical point. However, most support for this up to date uh, was either from um, very abstract theoretical models, which actually ignore some core properties of the flocking dynamics, like, for example, the ability of agents to switch neighbors. So, for example, they consider only agents on a fixed network, so more similar to a classical uh, Ising or XY model, um, and they didn't consider really this ability of agents to move and switch uh, neighbors, which is actually quite fundamental to flocking dynamics. There is some empirical evidence, however, there's uh, rather indirect evidence based, for example, on correlation lengths. Um, probably the most convincing evidence for this is actually from ants, where they look at collective transport, and there are, uh, there's a bunch of papers on collective transport in ants, and they very convincingly can show that it seems that really at the, at the transition point or um, bifurcation point, um, there seems where the ants operate when collectively transporting cargo. So I very much recommend for anyone interested to have a look at this kind of review article where they also refer to other works. However, um, you know, so far there was no systematic investigation of this criti criticality hypothesis in, for example, collective predator response, which at least biologically is the most prominent um, kind of effect of grouping, the benefit of grouping, where, where groups have an advantage. And this is what we wanted to set out together with Pascal, um, and this was his PhD thesis topic. So the basic idea is, um, as you all know, um, you know, inspired by physics, so you can think of a second order phase transition uh, where you have magnetization as the order parameter, and you have here potentially um, uh, temperature as an order parameter, or it could be essentially noise. Um, so basically, at low noise, uh, you have um, high ordering, so you have a highly magnetized system, and above a critical noise, you just get a disordered system. And what we know is that, that um, um, closer to critical points, the susceptibility, uh, or for biologists, the responsiveness of the system to external fields becomes maximal in finite system or diverges in, in a thermodynamic level. So in a sense, you can think of, a, of, a, uh, you know, of some type of matter of your system, and you can apply an external field as in physics, like a magnet, or you can think now of a predator actually being this external field, and you would argue now, and this is the, the core of the criticality hypothesis, that basically this responsiveness or susceptibility to react to a predator in the same way as the reactor field should be optimal at this uh, close to this critical point, or pseudo-critical point. And of course, if you go like to the disordered regime, then you know the system is so dominated by fluctuations that whatever you apply to, whether it's an external field or whether some perturbation, local perturbation like a predator, um, there's actually nothing. You know, the system doesn't really react apart from very, very locally. So there's no benefits of being in a collective. So here we really wanted now to say, okay, 
instead of looking really at a field as in a, in a statistical physics sense, let's look really at a real predator attacking such a system and see whether we can actually reproduce this um, optimal responsiveness to a predator at criticality. And this is in so far a non-trivial question because such a predator, as shown here, is actually not a homogeneous field applied to the whole system. It's actually a very local uh, perturbation, which also reacts to the system itself. So this is by far not clear whether you would get the same kind of optimal behavior at the critical point. <clears throat> How do we model this? Uh, we look at a very generic standard model of collective movement, as I uh, said before. So this is basically the equation of motion, and we assume fixed speed of individuals. So the only degree of freedom they have is to turn, um, to align with neighbors, or, or to move away or uh, get attracted by neighbors. So we have some social interactions here plus noise, uh, which act on the um, turning rate or the um, change in direction in the heading vector. And here we have the three standard interactions, as I said before. And throughout the next minutes, I will, we only modify this alignment interaction. So really the strength of the ferromagnetic align alignment between the agents, which acts as a control parameter uh, for the system, as well as the noise strength D, which is a second control parameter. With these two parameters, we can actually get this nice phase diagram. So this is a disordered state, this is the ordered state. So for high noise or low interaction strength, we are in a disordered state. For high alignment and or uh, low noise, you are in an ordered state. And you can now visualize how the model would look like. So this is in a highly ordered state. You have a cohesive group because of the attraction. They keep a preferred distance from each other because of the repulsion, but they also nicely ordered because of this alignment force, which is strong enough in this regime. Whereas down here, we get this disordered group, which still stays cohesive, but there's no orientational order, no symmetry breaking in the flock. So this is um, the general uh, setup. And um, now we can ask, you know, is the system actually maximally responsive to a predator attacking um, them? And what we can actually look at, for example, is the information transfer correlation between neighbors, and it becomes maximal at the transition, so this is the magenta line here, so this is as you expected. This would be the susceptibility as obtained from the fluctuations of the order parameter. That's what you should expect. Um, but what is also interesting maybe for biologists that you can look at some kind of biologically relevant measures, which is the capture rate. If you have this virtual predator, how many successful captures it does. And here you actually also show that in line with this more physics-based variables, you also get a minimum in the capture rate at the transition. So this is really advantageous of not being captured by this virtual predator hunting them. However, if you look at these systems behaving at different alignments and at different control parameters, and these are just three simulations for three different values of the alignment strength. So this would be here um, uh, supercritical. So this is a disordered state. This is in the middle is at the, uh, sorry, in the middle is at the transition. And the right hand is in a deep in order state. And what you notice is that not only the dynamics of the system change, you know, how well they are aligned, but also the structure of the group changes. And also like the nearest neighbor distances, so like the local density and density fluctuation change when you change the alignment parameter. So now you can ask, well, how much of this optimal response is actually because of this optimal information transfer, um, uh, basically uh, linked to the, the, the maximal correlation length in the system at criticality, and how much is actually due to the dynamic structure or the changes of the structure of the system? And this is what, what we um, um, did. And what turns out is what we did, how we did this, we actually generated a second system when the predator uh, uh, emerged, where we have a prey which does not respond to the predator. So it's like a control. There's no information transfer because the prey in this blue system does not respond to the predator, but we have the same structure at criticality, for example. So we have the same dynamical structure and we can now compare these two and see how much uh, actually, the system which responds, the black one, is actually better than the one that doesn't respond. And what turns out when we control for the group structure, then this optimum at critically vanishes. And you get only a, a maximum or best response um, at highly ordered regime. So yes, the um, critical regime or the critical uh, manifold is optimal, but this is not because of the optimal information transfer. It's not because of the uh, maximal correlation length. It appears for this particular setup to be only to the structure, spatial structure of the group at criticality, which is most regular and most dynamic. 
and not because of the actual propagation of information through the system. Okay, I'm already over time, so I should probably come to an end. Um, and uh, I will very just quickly run through a second part of this paper, which was um, actually more biologically motivated, because so far we looked at a group optimum. So basically, how should the group behave as a whole? But it doesn't tell us whether being critical is actually an evolution in a stable state when we have adaptation, evolutionary adaptation at the level of individuals. Because each individual can improve its alignment parameter by itself. So when everyone wants to increase its survival, where would the average order, uh, the average alignment parameter evolve to? And we did this with this individual level uh, uh, simulations with uh, evolution algorithm. And what you can show when you do this uh, evolution of your alignment parameter, of your control parameter, so to say, at the level of individuals, the system evolves not to the critical point, but actually to a, a point in a well-ordered regime. So the critical point is not an evolution in a stable state. On the contrary, it seems to be a highly unstable state evolutionary. So even if it would be best to operate for the system at criticality, the system actually ev uh, evolves maximally away from criticality. Um, so this is like the main conclusion of this part, and we can actually understand where this comes from, because at criticality we get the strongest cell sorting effects, and I don't have time to, much, to go much into that, but basically what makes the system most responsive at criticality to external perturbation is also eventually what makes it most uh, unstable in evolutionary sense, uh, the critical point, and therefore this is uh, by, by natural selection the system would uh, always evolve away from criticality. Um, so this is something I will jump over now. So this is a second part result. If you're interested, I recommend to have a look at the paper. And this is just a big picture, um, which I will also skip uh, for the second part of the talk. But instead, I would just conclude. Um, so we, you know, we looked at this second part of the generally very simplified model of collective behavior. But of course, this is all model based on this type of benefits of criticality, but also on criticality being evolution unstable. And um, is this really relevant for real systems? And what you will see in the next two talks is that there's actually maybe a different type of a critical point that might be potentially relevant for collective escape response in fish, which is rather related to a branching process than to a kind of a, um, symmetry breaking transition like in an XY model. And this uh, will be discussed in the two talks, following talks by Vinny and Lewis, who looked at different systems, both times fish, but very different systems, and, and find slightly different results, which, which point to uh, the overall complexity of this uh, issue. And uh, with this, thank you for your attention. Sorry for being a few minutes over time. And thanks to all the collaborators, because of course this work has not been done in vacuum, but with many uh, really great people. And thanks for all the funding agencies that supported this um, over the years. Okay. Thank you. And uh, let us thank our speaker for a very interesting talk. So, any questions? Well, then I have one. Uh, uh, just uh, probably I missed something, but. Uh, definitely for me, uh, when you talk about such collective behavior, grouping, fear, schooling, and so on, um, for me, um, as uh, say uh, somebody not deeply involved in this uh, issue, would be definitely ch survival chances uh, or something like a, a survival probability up to a given time of a given object within this ensemble of objects. Yeah. Um, did you have a look on uh, such a measure with respect to your alignment parameter, the uh, parameter of degree of collectivity or something like that? Did it really uh, getting more and more collective or um, vice versa, dispersing uh, did it increase chances to survive of any individual object or um, how it happens? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this is a great question. Um, let me just open maybe this slide. So we did not really look um, explicitly in the actual survival time distributions, for example. 
But we looked at this implicitly in this evolutionary simulations because, um, let me go here, essentially how we selected the next generation was, um, you know, how many agents died in a finite time simulations for one generation. So we did basically 80 simulations of this blocking system and we let this virtual predator attack. And then we look after a certain time how many died. Uh -huh. So that basically, you know, gives you like a like a cumulative dis uh, uh, survival distribution in a certain sense. And uh -huh. then, based on this, we selected the next generation, and the parameters uh, who, which were most successful were propagated to the next generation. And then we could look like which parameters are actually better at surviving, so to say, so which have a longer survival times given this predator, and they were the ones which were moving to the next generation. And so we, we could show actually that, um, you know, in disordered systems, once you have a symmetry breaking and uh, you get actually this strong cell sorting. So, for example, front and back makes a difference, left and right. And also whether you're in a high density, locally high density or locally low density. And it turns out that, for example, agents with a high alignment, when, when, when they evolve high alignment, they actually turn up to move more ordered. So they are more at the front, but also at higher density typically. So there's a correlation between this local... Uh, with the location within the group in different in different dimensions, so to say, and that means that they are because of that they are actually more likely to survive, and this is exactly the explanation why the critical point is unstable. Because if everyone is at the critical point, uh, the group is most responsive, but then I gain an advantage if I get a little bit more ordered, uh, sorry, a little bit more strong alignment, then my survival time, so to say, becomes longer and I'm more likely to uh, pass my genes to the next generation. And this makes this critical point evolution unstable. So long story short, we did not look explicitly into this, but there is definitely quite a strong impact from this evolution, from what we know from the evolution simulations, that what your parameters are with respect to others, where are you located in the group within a high density region or low density region where you're more dispersed or less dispersed, more ordered or less ordered, uh, how long you will survive with such a virtual predator. And there okay. are actually some experimental results of this, which, which show, for example, that uh, fish in a high density um, setting are less likely attacked than in a low density setting, for example. Okay, uh, but uh, then there is there should be some um, other kind of a cost function because um, fish or what any kind of animals, they don't move, move for nothing. They have also continuously to search for food. And uh, so uh, true strategy of living uh, things will be not only escaping apparently the predators, but uh, as they are also predators from uh, some other objects, it will be to find more and more and for the whole ansible to have a possibility to feed any of them. So they maybe should be dispersed and there should be some trade-off apparently between, between being co uh, uh, compact uh, uh, and uh, as such uh, or move collectively and as such be less um, uh, vulnerable to attacks by uh, predators, but also somehow disperse in order to eat. Yeah, no, this is an excellent question, uh, you know, excellent point. So yes, indeed. So this is for now, we only look at one uh, context, maybe, uh, namely predation, like a predator attacking. Oh yes, this is absolutely justified because uh, it is a complex system and uh, just uh, going uh, from the simplest cases uh, one by one and understanding what happens there, it is absolutely legitimate to do it. I don't object, I don't, don't say anything bad about your work. No, 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 no. I, I, I know, I know, but, but you are pointing to the right question that a lot of people are starting to think now, you know, that we have to adjust like the, the individual in the group or the group have not to be only optimal in one um, setting, but they have to optimize across many settings. So maybe um, there is actually like a, a, a different parameter reasons you should operate for different things that you do, whether you search for food or whether you avoid a predator. Um, true, 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 uh, true, true, but it also means that um, you should, one should be very cautious when comparing with, uh, comparing with uh, real life experiments. Yes, yes. So, but the good thing is that we have pretty, now with the new techniques, there are pretty well controlled um, experiments and we will show some of those uh, in the next two talks. There, there will be a lot of experimental data there as well. 
which allow us to maybe look at this particular questions uh, in more detail with better data. But um, in general, I think that then my take on this story right now is, for example, regarding crit crit criticality and whether animal groups should operate at a pseudo critical point, is that um, I find this highly fascinating as a physicist, and I, I uh, think there might be some of this. It would be a really beautiful organizing principle for the systems, and we actually find some evidence for this, uh, at least in one system, mm -hmm. uh, but it will depend on the ecological context. And what seems to be more important for the system is that they actually are able to tune the distance to the pseudo critical point in a self organized manner. In the sense that depending on the context, they, they are either far away from this or they get very close or even to the pseudo critical point. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, then ask the question how do they do this? You know, how do they control bottom up with only local information the macroscopic property of the system? And I think this is a beautiful research question, which I hope I can address with my research, but I it would be. Just very interested to, to um, see anyone answering this at any point in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any other question? Yes, there are on the screen two more, at least more, uh, three more questions. The oh. first one by Jonathan Domkens, then uh, Reinhard Volk, and then also me. We raise the hands on Reinhard, the screen. Reinhard, please, okay. Yeah, if I, um, so, Pavel, I, um, I'm, I'm quite interested in this criticality perspective, um, and we can we can talk more about this. But but do you did you come across um, this perspective also in in uh, models of um, human behavior, of uh, network models, um, agent-based models, etc. That um, so not just in the animal uh, context. No. Well, I, I know some people that think about it, like Tilo Gross, of course, uh, you know, because he's very much into criticality. There's a lot of work, as I said, on neuronal systems, so like individual, so to say, brains. Um, there's not much work on groups so far. So I think it plays a huge role there, but uh, or could potentially play a huge role, but I'm not aware of anyone looking at this systematically, at, at least. Okay, thank you. Okay, Reinhard, please. Yes, at the beginning, you showed uh, the scenery where several flocks uh, moved around and then they merged or they split it. So uh, what is the reason for that? I think of domains in, in, in the magnet. You have an interaction between just the neighbors, but you also have dipolar interaction and therefore you have domain building. And is something similar in this swarm, in this uh, flocking? I mean, if you have several flocks, which flock wins to, uh, so you have, you, you see it, some yeah. merge, yeah. and who wins, is there an additional interaction to be considered? So this is, this is an excellent question. So this is now simulation of the Vichic model, like the symbols model, yes. one can imagine. So there's only alignment, so only ferromagnetic alignment between agents that are within a certain range. And it averages over all agents within a certain range. So it's, these mm -hmm. are not binary interactions, but actually like a kind of local mean field interaction, so to say. Yeah. Uh, but very local. So there's no attraction and no repulsion. So they can be at arbitrarily high densities. And the splitting and merging actually happens due to fluctuations, which you have noise in the system. So these, once you get two mm -hmm. parts of the flock moving slightly different angles, they continue to move there and might eventually split up, or mm -hmm. they can merge when they meet. So this is really it's just, uh, yeah. So there is something no... between uh, between um, uh, uh, from convection basically in order. Um, if you have a attraction, in particular longer attraction uh, interactions, you might actually get something like ripening, uh, like Oswald ripening, where actually all the different smaller flocks merge and merge until you get one single blob that stays cohesive. If your attraction is sufficiently long, but then uh, this is a different mechanism. But usually you get this fission fusion dynamics of the splitting and merging very prominently, even in systems with local, as long as the attraction is local, they are always fluctuation that can drive this apart. And I think this is still a very open question on understanding uh, the actually the um, statistics of these clusters. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We know that this clustering is, or this giant number of fluctuations, so to say, they have been predicted by theory, so that the density fluctuation, which can be actually linked, or, or people believe that they are linked to this cluster formation, 
that they are they are an intrinsic part of the systems. But if you really think of true clustering like here, where you have empty space in between, um, I think people don't have a good understanding what sets the actual cluster statistics yet. And we have actually a paper on this um, with another grad student where we try to look very much in detail in the large uh, parameter space variation and this clustering states seems to be very prominent at low noise in particular, as we see here. If you increase the noise, the system gets more and more homogeneous, so then you don't get this, this strong groups. So, um, yeah. Yeah, thank, you. Thank, you. So far. thank you. Thank you. Your quote, I? please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, my question is about uh, more or less middle of your talk when you spoke about uh, movement of agents with the medium with obstacles. And uh, although you warned us that it is finite size system and far from thermodynamic limit, I can uh, make a, could I make an analogy between uh, what we were doing in physics? When we were looking for ordering, uh, when we have, say, magnetic ordering in presence of non-magnetic impurities. Mm -hmm. And then what we observe, when these non-magnetic impurities are uncorrelated, it would be one type of magnetic ordering. But when you have correlated magne uh, non-magnetic impurities, especially long range correlated, the ordering will be different. Mm -hmm. And what matters for this process, only the way the pair correlation function impurity, impurity decays with distance. So here, uh, my, my understanding of this model is that your impurities are uncorrelated. Yeah. You just put them randomly with certain concentration. Yeah. Would you expect, would you expect uh, that uh, the, the qualitative change in your phenomenon when you put them according to some correlation? Mm -hmm. Excellent question. So uh, first of all, I would love to, if you could maybe send me the papers because I, I still definitely with need to pleasure. Do yeah. more uh, uh, catching up with the uh, physics literature on this because I believe there must be quite a lot of there. But uh, yeah, it will make a huge difference. So we actually, you know, I didn't have time to, to show this. We actually not even published this, but we looked at long range correlated obstacle fields as well where we put this type of destruction sites, for example, in lattices with different properties and see how this affects. And of course, you will get actually very different behavior there. Um, and I should also mention that my collaborator on this, Fernando Peruani, he did work also on um, different models of flocking in heterogeneous environments before. So this is so-called topological model. So this is the like K-nearest neighbor interaction. And he worked on um, uh, metric interaction, so really with a finite range. And what he could show is uh, that whereas for um, 2D empty environments, we have long range order for the metric interactions. For the 2D with heterogeneities as here, you actually get quasi long range order. Um, so already like the, the, the type of order changes and um, that there's like something like optimal noise and so on. So there are interesting effects. And for this model, this also changes um, here, because we have a long range order when it gets ordered, which is kind of interesting. Um, so really the type of interaction matters, but also the properties of the field. And I'm pretty sure for the metric case, it would be also long range order if we get long range correlation in the, in the heterogeneities instead of um, quasi uh, long range order. And but here we have already long range order, presumably for non-correlated heterogeneities. And this gets, I'm not sure whether we would see a qualitative change in this model. Maybe, probably, but we haven't looked at this. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pavel. 